Hello and welcome to The Hearing. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is from 1985, Misplaced Childhood by Marillion. Marillion are a British progressive rock band who formed in 1979, originally calling themselves Silmarillion, after J.R.R. Tolkien's book The Silmarillion, but they shortened it around 1981 1980-1981 uh, to avoid copyright issues. Uh, <laughs> the band released has released 19 albums since their 83 debut, Script for a Gesture's Tear, four with their original vocalist Fish, yes, that's his stage name, and 15 with his replacement Steve Hogarth, and their sound has varied quite a bit throughout the course of their career. Uh, the band themselves have stated that each new album tends to represent a reaction to the previous one, um, and for this reason, their output is hard to pigeonhole. Um, Misplaced Childhood is their third album. Um, it's a concept album loosely based on the childhood of Fish, who was inspired by a brief incident that occurred while he was under the influence of LSD. <laughs> It was released on June 17th, 1985 on EMI, produced by Chris Kimsey, and features Fish on vocals, Steve Rothery on guitars and additional bass guitar, Mark Kelly on keyboards, Pete Trevavis on bass guitar, and Ian Mosley on drums. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description, uh, if you're watching this on, on YouTube or on our blog at johnandscotto.com, you'll find links to find Misplaced Childhood on Spotify and YouTube so you can follow along. On to the tracks. Track one, Pseudo Silk Kimono. Now this starts off with what might be one of my bigger problems with the album. <laughs> Very dated keyboard sounds. Yeah, the keyboards on this are just... I mean, they're dated for 1985, even. I don't know about that. Um, uh, some of this stuff, like, if you, you listen to, like, older prog, it's like, whoa, wow, I remember, like, Hackett using that in, well, like, 77. Some keyboard you know? players are ahead of the curve more than others. But <laughs> and I think that's one thing you run into with, with a genre that is, or a band that is very keyboard heavy, is that keyboard players are the most, most, techno, most technologically oriented of musicians. You know, guitar players are perfectly happy to play things that are 50 years old. Same with bass players, drummers. Keyboard players want, you know, if they're particularly synth players, want the newest thing. And right. the newest thing tends to get dated. Right. You know, and, as cool and... as the DX7 was back in the day and as nostalgic as I am for it, it's very easy to spot these days. <laughs> Also, this one could have used some percussion. It's just vocals, keyboards, guitar, and bass. Um, and it's basically a prelude to the album. Right. It's just a little injury. It doesn't go very far, but it does set up the next track nicely. Yeah. Um, it's got some nice, subtle bass, some piercing guitar. I like some of the lyrics. Um, a, mor a morning mare rides in the starless shutter of my eyes. A morning mare. Does he mean a horse or like a morning nightmare? Because he mm. rides in the starless shutters of my eyes. Um, also, like, um, the spirit of a misplaced childhood is rise, rising to speak his mind. Love that line. Um, an orphan of heartbreak, disillusioned and scarred a refugee. Um, like, but like I said, it's a short prelude to the album. On to track two, Kaylee. This is my favorite. This is the one I listen to on a very regular basis. Um... And I love how Silk Kimono bleeds into it. Um, in That's fact, probably you, my favorite part of the album is how the songs flow together. Yeah, yeah. If you listen to this one on Spotify or if you, if you have you know a misbegotten MP3, uh, you'll hear a little the very end of Silk Kimono before Kaylee starts. Um, yeah, love the guitar on this one. This is the one that made me a fan of Steve Rothery, um, and it's. One of the few, it's, I think it's the only song that I've learned the rhythm guitar part verbatim. One <laughs> of two guitar solos that I've learned verbatim. I've been playing, well, I don't play much anymore, but I started playing guitar in 85. So, and this and Overkill by Minute Work are the only solos I've learned verbatim. Um, love. I mean, I thought this was a bit too hair metal ish, you know? <laughs> Maybe that's why I like it. I'm such a love hair metal. Um, <laughs> love bass tone the bass tone in general on this album is just perfect um and he's not a very showy player he just plays the right parts um, and you know the guitar parts of this song are, are fucking brilliant and, yeah. and and i wouldn't change a thing about them 
it's it's really the chorus and verse that I'm kind of like, oh man. <laughs> I like the lyrics. Um, it's that whole you know pining for the lost love thing that that only yeah. no thing that I still get into. Um, and I got to point out because there's a criticism that Fish gets a lot that I didn't even really notice until I prepped for this I album. I think and... he should have stayed with Barney Miller, honestly. But I'm bummed. That I didn't catch until I started prepping and really listened to him because I love Fish's voice, but he sounds a lot like Peter Gabriel. He was, uh, you know, <laughs> he was whoever he needed to sound like, you well, know, most of the time it's Peter Gabriel. There's also a lot of Ian Anderson in there. Yeah, because he, he has Ian Anderson. He has Anderson's kind of sneering, you know, posturing yeah. at times. Gabriel doesn't have that. Love Gabriel's voice, but it's kind of small. Right. Gabriel's voice is kind of small and kind of yearning. Fish oh, can yeah. go big. Yeah, G- Gabriel's about the the. You can hear the anguish and the suffering yeah. in, in the lines, especially now that he's older and mm-hmm. stuff. It's yeah, it's heartbreaking. I mean, he's great at what he does, but yeah. you know, Fish learned obviously a hell of a lot from that. And he cites a lot of other influences, but I do hear mostly Gabriel and Anderson. Um, also, just love the bass in the outro. But this is one of my favorite songs. Um, it, it, it's really the highlight of the album to me. Um, another way of saying it's all downhill from here. <laughs> uh, on to track three. Another one I really like, uh, Lavender. The song features a number of verses that are reminiscent of the English folk song and nursery rhyme Lavender Blue. Um Again, great transition from Kelly. Love the melody in the first part, the part that doesn't reference Lavender Blue. Um, love how the, what I call the verse, um, love how the bass kind of just punctuates it. Um, there's some very soft uh, drums and some really nice punctuating bass. And then we get into the chorus, which is just a repetition of that folk song with new lyrics. Um, but I, do... I find his lyrics so painful. <laughs> really? Yes, I do. Now, the whole dilly dilly thing in this is straight from Lavender Blue. Yeah. <laughs> he just, that's most of it is taken directly from the old folk song. Um, uh, I just like how it builds and the drums get louder and there's a great guitar solo at the end. Um, I mean, you can't do multiple the song lines and you sure as hell can't put them back to back on the album. <laughs> Uh, on to track four, Bittersweet. This um, is composed of four parts. Brief Encounter, Lost Weekend, Blue Angel. Oh, five parts. Uh, misplaced Rendezvous and Windswept Thumb. like the name of that last one. Um, it opens with this very atonal thing with a lot of percussion. Reminded me, and I think it probably heavily influenced, uh, a, a few years later, Bonham's Disregard of Timekeeping. Um, that opens with a very similar sort of atonal percussion heavy thing. Uh, yeah, I was thinking um, something from Please Don't Touch. It might even be the uh, title track, Please Don't Touch, for from Hackett in okay. 77. The keyboards are definitely straight off of it. So Marillion ripped off Hackett, Bottom right. ripped off Marillion. Interesting. <laughs> if you've ever heard this, the only single from Bonham, Wait For You, it starts with this very atonal sort of thing. Oh, I remember that song, yeah. Yeah, this yeah sort of, like that it. sort of percussion-heavy atonal opening. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it sounds a lot like this and apparently a lot like that Hackett track. Um, I mean, I thought he was just ripping Robert Plant, honestly, uh, and some of the well, stuff the singer that he was, was doing. Well, the singer was very Robert that. Plant, yeah. But um, musically, I thought, uh, I mean, because wasn't that after Now and Zen? I don't remember. Maybe a year or two. Yeah. It's, it's, they're it was pretty still close 80. on each other. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, the singer from Bonham was very much aping yeah. Plant. Oh, yeah, definitely. everybody fucking aped plant back then. Anybody singing any kind of heavy music. That's uh, true. Looking at you, Billy Squire. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, on to the next section, Lost Weekend. Uh, that atonal section does eventually work its way into a groove and a spoken vocal. Normally, I like spoken vocals, but in this case, it just seems a little self-important. Yeah, that, I mean, Fish, I think he could be brilliant when he's just telling a story. Yeah. But when he takes poetic license, yeah. I find it to become embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then it goes into an instrumental break. It's instrumental break that's very classic prog. 
ah, the guitar work is worth the price of admission on this album. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's just amazing. And that's, and I'm, I'm still torn on, and we'll get to this later, but I'm still torn on the rec- whether to recommend it. But the playing is brilliant. I love Fish's yeah. voice. The composition. Well, right, yeah, his voice is great too. I, I the composition is just way too fucking derivative. We'll get to mm-hmm. that as it gets worse oh, yeah. and worse. Um. I did that, like the Who reference at the end, uh, The Rain yeah, on Me. Yeah. Um, next section, Blue Angel. Um, it brings back the motif from Lavender with a melody that's just kind of a slight variation on Lavender. And then we have this first quick change from Misplaced Rendezvous. It goes into this kind of folky prog thing with these synth flutes. <laughs> and it's the first section where the title is included in the lyric, so I knew it was the next section. Um, and then we get into windswept, windswept Thumb, which is musically very similar to Misplaced Rendezvous, only know that they separated because Windswept Thumb is mentioned. <laughs> On to track five, Heart of Lothian. Um, the title is a reference to a traditional region of Scotland, uh, Fish himself being a Midlothian, and a reference to the Heart of Mid- Midlothian, a.k.a. the Royal, Royal Mile, a mosaic heart on, in the pavement of Edinburgh's Royal Mile, Apologies for that mispronunciation, because um, I, I, as it was coming out, I knew it was wrong. Um, this I just, was hoping for an instrumental here. <laughs> I was too, and I thought it was because yeah. it kind of continues the groove from Winsept Thumb. Winsept right. Thumb kind of builds on it. We do have some more dated keyboards, but that's unavoidable. Yeah. Um, Fish comes in. I do like how de- how intense his vocal gets, but the more intense he gets, the more Gabriel he gets. <laughs> And these lyrics are just the worst. <laughs> I only qu- qu- quoted the lyrics in a few spots, but I didn't pay much attention to them beyond that. I, I had to look up, you know, just to make sure I wasn't like shitting on something that, that you know, I'm missing something like incredibly poetic. That uh-huh. it was like just, just nationalistic, you know, uh-huh. pride of Scotland sort of thing. Right, and I'm right, like, right. yeah, yeah, but that's still well, a no for me. <laughs> it's about his, his life, you know, and that was a part of his life. Um. This is on to, on to the next section, Curtain Call. The vocal is very low. He gets soft, which is unusual for Fish. He usually is kind of a belter. Um, and the bass is really loud. It almost overtakes him, which is an interesting mixing choice. Yeah. Um, don't really have much else to say about it. On to track six, Waterhole, parentheses, Expresso Bongo. <laughs> Got to give him credit for some interesting titles. <laughs> There's no transition to this one. Just has a really nice syncopated groove. Love the biting guitar tone. Oh the, yeah, the mix I think is a he's little muddy. Strongest on this one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he was clearly go ripping off. Yes, but yeah, I mean, uh, I got it. He was ripping off a Hackett at points. He sounds very Alex Lifeson. Um, you know, everybody this like in this band is derivative. Yes, though. Yeah, I think this is he was doing for more eighties. Yes, and and mm-hmm. you know. The music is enough to distract me from Fish's lyrics, so I think like, they were good or bad on this one. The but mix, I, the mix I think gets this a, one is my strongest. Okay, the mix gets a little muddy. I think the vocal is a little low. There's a marimba that kind of I think swallows up a lot of frequencies. Yes. Um, speaking of marimba, um, <laughs> not that there's marimba in the next one, but the fans of the bands I'm about to talk about will know why I talk, mentioned it. On to track seven. Lords of Backstage. This is so fucking Rush, it's disgusting. And I love Rush. <laughs> There's a 7-8 groove that they practically have fucking trademarked. <laughs> I did like this one, though. Not, which Rush song are they ripping off, though? It's, it's a bunch of them. There's It's just yeah. this 7-8 groove that Rush fall into a lot. Um, <laughs> most notably, I think, is in... Not in terms of instrumentation, but in terms of just the rhythm... Um, the beginning of uh, subdivisions. Okay. The count is identical, um, and it gets very repetitive because it just switches back and forth between that groove and a slight variation of that groove. And um, I think I, I like how like all of these tracks, like six, seven, eight, they how they flow together. Mm-hmm. I think that's the the strongest where where they're doing that here. This is my weakest just because they are blatantly fucking <laughs> ripping off one of my favorite bands and it's very repetitive and not in a fun way. On to Blind Curve. This is another big concept, long extended piece yeah. um, with, um, let's see, again, five sections. Um, vocal under a blood light. P- 
Passing Strangers, um, Milo, Perimeter Walk, and Threshold. Um, not exactly a transition, but it does flow nicely. Um, nice kind of mid to slow, mid-tempo to slow groove. Love how pronounced the drums are in the first section. Um, then gets into a nice soft vocal for Passing Strangers. Mix gets a little muddy again. Uh, I think the synth patch is just a little too close to cymbals. It eats up some frequencies. Um, nice Gilmore-esque guitar solo. <laughs> I was going to say, like, do you recognize the guitar solo? Yeah, it's yeah. very Gilmore. <laughs> I, I, like, he starts off Gilmore, but then he, he makes it his own as he goes into it, though. Mm. I do like the lyrics here, though. Um, some of us go down in a blaze of obscurity. Um, I, I do enjoy, I did like that one. Um, and it's an interesting kind of ragged, meandering kind of vocal tone. I mean, I his lyrics weren't bad, except for the childhood part. Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> On to the next section, Milo. Again, another quick change to a folky thing. This is just a random solo guitar piece. Interesting tone, very well played. Um, kind of finger-picked. Eh, not much else to say about it, other than <laughs> Steve Rothery wanted to show off for a bit. I think he just composed this kind of short piece that they didn't know what to do with, and so they stuck it in the middle of this longer piece. Um, on to the next section, Perimeter Walk. Love the bass tone. Another spoken vocal. Um, lyrics get very repetitive. Um, this is where he goes on about my childhood, my childhood. Yes, that, that's exactly what I was referring to. That, um, that's That's just wow. And it's <laughs> mostly mixed just a little bit too low. I think you were trying to go for sort of a um, subliminal thing, but fish can't do subliminal. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, the concept here. Um, wow. Uh, I, I thought just looking over stuff, someone had this as like the fourth best concept album ever. And I was kind of like, really? Wow. <laughs> Please um, explain to me the concept fourth? here. <laughs> I know. Maybe... 10th if they had said 10th i could say maybe um, uh, I, I didn't go like over like all the other you know concept albums of history but i mean really okay 2112 quadrophenia Ooh. uh lamb the yeah. wall <laughs> well i think you know it's interesting because the concept here is very much like the wall isn't it the word i let, let me get to my next note for threshold. Okay. Because okay. all I have, all I have is the Heart of Lothian motif comes back, and it gets very Wall era Floyd. Right, but the Wall made sense because I mean it's about his father dying in the war, mm. and of course him growing into this asshole, you know, right. and and putting the blame on that. But what what I mean, did we miss something about his father dying in the war here? Like the, it becomes this anti-war thing. Just out of nowhere, almost. <laughs> yeah, it, it starts off with this lost love and you know this fantasy of like falling in love with a girl walking through a park, wow. and then I'm not sure where it goes because like okay, he he grew up in Scotland and then right. he got famous and you know the, the issues there and there are issues there, but it's it's kind of there's no big there's no there's no conflict there's no there doesn't seem to be a central conflict in the album. It like. It's about him and his childhood and his, you know, about his life. And then all of a sudden he sees this war widow, you know, cleaning the, the, hus the deceased husband's uniform. And then from there on, it's like an anti-war thing. And it's kind of like, where does one come from the other? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how, how, I think the concept lost focus somewhere along the way. <laughs> But that's my point, is I'm not sure there really was much of a story. Yeah. You know, it's just kind of this happened, then this happened, then this happened. <laughs> There's no central villain, is, is the best way of putting it. And not in, not in terms of a character, but an event that is effectively the villain. In The Wall, the father dying is the central. Yeah. The death of the father is the central villain in The Wall. Yeah. That's what causes that's the catalyst it, it, it kind of makes the hero into the villain in the end though yeah you but know. that's the catalyst yeah it's true. there's no catalyst on this in the story it's just stuff happening <laughs> <laughs> on to track nine childhoods and nice relaxed groove bit of a departure musically uh for them from the rest of the album 
I like uh, you like how the chorus picks up. I thought uh, this is probably his worst uh, guitar track. Mm. <laughs> at least at least during like the the verse where he's doing this really bad follow you follow me Rutherford yeah, yeah, kind of thing yeah I was like oh um, it really? does you're gonna steal that you know it does resolve the whole childhood thing and it, it's all it's about him you know kind of seeing that he has to take responsibility for all you know everything that's happened to him and you know being an adult and all of that yeah that's kind of nice it does get a bit repetitive um yeah I like the I mean, the chorus was good I thought yeah, yeah. musically at least mm-hmm. on to track 10 the finale white feather Interesting groove. I like the drums. Mm-hmm. Nice jaggy guitar tone. Travis, especially on this one, was great. Gets a bit repetitive. I have no uh, bloody I clue mean, what the lyrics are about. Yeah, there's like this anti-war sentiment, and it's it kind of feels ham-fisted. Um, mm-hmm. the, I mean, the sing-along is pretty cool at the end. It's it's kind of obligatory, but it's cool. Yeah, it sticks with you after you've listened to it. You're like, oh yeah. Well, that's that's an interesting way to put that because what I noticed after listening to it because usually for better or worse something when when I review an album something will get stuck in my head. Yeah. You know there will be some memory of it, some feeling about the album for the rest of the day until we talk about it. Ten minutes after I listened to this, it was gone. <laughs> I actually had to go back and skim through to remind myself. I had no memory of it. It was just very much kind of there. And that's where it leaves me. I think I'm, I have, don't recommend, but I think after talking about it, I'm undecided. <laughs> I, I'm, I'll be a flat out no, honestly. Because, okay. I, I mean, the lyrics are just, the, the guitar work is fantastic. His vocals are great. Go in for the performances. Yeah, you know, this would be much better if I didn't understand English and could just (laughs) listen to them play and listen to him vocalize and just not know what he's singing. And then be so much happier. The composition is very derivative. You know? Oh my God. I I joked with you earlier that if we named hearing episodes like we do zombie takeouts, I would suggest Genesis of Saga. Uh, Floyd Rush. Because <laughs> well, we like, didn't talk about Saga, but there's a lot of Saga in here, too. Ah, I forgot about Saga. On the Loose. A lot of On the Loose in here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, it's been a long time since I've heard Saga, it, honestly. That's the one I listen to regularly. Um, uh, you know, I always th- remember that song, On the Loose, but I never remembered the band's name that did it. <laughs> it's. I've listened to the rest of that album. It's very similar. Isn't um, so, wasn't Saga pretty much just doing a sticks though? I mean, they were pop prog. Yeah, not in a, not in a cool St. Vincent kind of way, but they were like the pop, like just pop prog musicianship with very poppy hooks. Well, there were. I mean, and I think these guys started. You know, Marillion started. Well, around that's the same what this time. album is too, which is why I thought a Saga. Is, it's very very poppy. Like um, they around the time of Journey and mm-hmm. Sticks and. Um, yeah. Boston, I guess you could even put in there too. Well, Boston was before they were seventies band. They were big arena rock. Um, well, right, all, you know, all those guys I was listing are kind of late seventies, yeah. mid to late seventies. Six seventies too, yeah. Kansas, right? But they but all, these guys, I thought, all... started like seventy nine, right? And I'll, I'll admit, I like sticks. I like classic sticks, old sticks. Um, they're all of those bands are better than this. I can't be a Steeler fan and not like Renegade. You know, that yeah, would be yeah. sacrilege. Right. <laughs> they, um, for some reason, have played that every for every game for I don't know how many years now. <laughs> it's just, I'm surprised I didn't think of this when we when we did, and I'm glad I didn't put this directly after Power Windows, because that would have been an obvious mood. <laughs> and I would have hated it even more. So, I mean, these guys, and kind of Spock's beard, you know, they're, they're both, you know, you have to go in knowing that they are almost a tribute act in a way. Stocks you know? is way more derivative, way more yeah. re- original than this, though. Like, Stocks uh, wears the, their influences on their sleeve, right. but they don't rip things off directly. Uh, <laughs> I, I think they do it with a lot more charm than this, though. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Neil, is, Neil Morse is a lot more um, likable than Fish. <laughs> And Fish, uh, I mean, the work he did on to- one of Tony Banks's solo albums 
it, it's it sums this up because one of the songs, "Another Murder of a Day," is fucking brilliant. It's the story mm-hmm. about his wife who was a heroin addict, and and to hear those lyrics with Tony Banks's music and Daryl Sturmer on guitar, mm-hmm. just fucking fantastic. And then there's this other song where it's like. You're just a devil with a pretty angel face. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> and I think Fish mostly did the lyrics on those. Okay. So. <laughs> and speaking of other things, Fish are on. That's a nice transition. Until next time, when we'll be reviewing Into the Electro Castle by Arion. This will be interesting. Have you ever heard any Arion? I you gave me a CD long ago. I think I I don't know how far I made it into it, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> um, it's uh, uh, the project of a Dutch and mostly instrumentalist and composer named Arjen Lucasen. Um, he brings in usually other lead guitarists. Um, he plays all all of the rhythm guitar, a little bit of the lead usually. Um, most of the keyboards, all of the for lack of a better way of putting it, rhythm keyboards. Um, brings in a drummer, occasionally brings in a bass player, sometimes plays himself, brings in soloists, brings in a variety of other singers. They are true rock operas, <laughs> where it's not just one person singing all the parts, it's this cast of singers and cast of soloists playing these albums. And you so this it's... has like eight singers on it. You think it's uh, more of a concept than the fourth best uh, concept album? I would put this way. I would put. Oh God, um, I would put Electric Castle in the top ten of what I've heard. Ah, uh, let me see. Where's the? Uh, let me find the, the publication that called this the fourth greatest concept album. Wow, <laughs> I do right there. I can name. Okay, in the Electric Castle, um, Days of Future Past. I'm just naming well, concept right, albums yeah. that are better than this. Um, <laughs> Hemispheres. If I want to double dip and go for another Rush album, it's Classic Rock Magazine. Uh-huh. They they placed it on its list of rock's 30 greatest concept album and named it one of the top 10 essential progressive rock releases of the 80s. Well, you could see, I, you could probably, I don't know. I could, there's probably stronger Marillion releases, I think, than this. This is their big famous album. This is their claim to fame. So I'm not saying there, there very well might be better albums. I wouldn't be, I would hope so. Um, I only know one other album. It's kind of, um, but this was their big one, which is why I chose it. Um, and it's yeah. got Kaylee on it, which I love. Um, but but next week will be interesting with Arion. Um, Fish plays the Highlander, not not from the movie, <laughs> but a Highlander. Of course. Um, the basic concept is this alien race kidnaps a bunch of pe- humans from different time periods, and has them compete for reasons <laughs> we find out at the end. Um, and so they're you know, different people, various people from different periods, and he plays a Highlander. So, so his accent pays off. Of course. So that'll be interesting. That's next week. And so then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.